2023 can be characterised as a year where equity markets exhibited very narrow breadth, meaning overall returns were driven by a very strong performance from only a small number of companies. Today, we'll discuss some of the key takeaways from the year with Terry Smith, founder of the asset management business Fundsmith LLP, as well as discussing some of the key factors driving markets and what the outlook looks like for the coming 12 months. Hello and welcome to the Investor Insights Podcast, hosted by Killick & Co. My name is Gordon Smith, and in each episode, I'll be interviewing portfolio managers from across the investment industry to gain from their expertise in the specialist areas in which they invest, and to question them on the topical issues of today. Killick & Co. is an independently owned wealth manager, which opened its first office in 1989, and provide services to help families save, plan, and invest. And you can find more details of the unique ways in which we do that on our website, killick.com. In this episode, we speak to Terry Smith, lead manager of the Fundsmith Equity Fund, the global equity strategy run by the successful asset management business Fundsmith, which was founded by Terry back in 2010. Terry has worked in the financial industry since 1974 in a career which has spanned several roles, including as a stockbroker, a financial analyst, most notably covering the banking sector, and as CEO of Tullet Prebon. The Fundsmith Equity Fund will, I'm sure, be well known to many listeners. Its distinctive style can be summarised as being a concentrated, long-term buy-and-hold strategy, where the manager seeks to only own stocks that have the ability to sustainably compound high rates of return over the long term. There's a really very strict criteria employed in order to identify candidates for the portfolio. This includes a requirement for high and consistent returns on equity in cash and through businesses whose advantages are difficult to replicate and don't require high levels of leverage to generate returns. This process excludes large swathes of global indices and in many cases, whole industry segments. This is an interesting time to speak to Terry following what was a turbulent year for global equities in 2022, as markets digested a material change in economic conditions, and then an equally challenging period of very narrow market breadth in 2023. However, as markets see continued evidence of a decline in the high levels of inflation across developed economies, attention is drawn to the corporate and consumer fragilities caused by the significant tightening of financial conditions over these last two years. And against this backdrop, exposure to high quality, lowly geared businesses with a high degree of resilience, often recurring revenue, becomes ever more attractive within portfolios. Hi, Terry. Thank you so much for for joining us. How how are you today? Fine. Thank you. You? Yeah, very well. Thank you. Very well. So the, the, the first question that we, we tend to ask and to start these discussions aims to try and get a bit of a kind of insight into your typical working week. And I appreciate we're catching you in the middle of what's been a quite a busy, actually quite eventful kind of earnings season. So I'm sure that's taken quite a lot of your time up at the minute. But are there any kind of interesting anecdotes that maybe from recent company meetings or, or, or insights from a, a research trip you've been on that you might be able to share with us or even just an interesting article or, or kind of what are you reading yeah. at the moment? There's a few things I, I think to touch upon in that regard. I mean, you know, the, the working week, working day does vary quite a bit. And this is one of those periods where it's very heavy in terms of results, obviously, because we we're, we're getting the calendar year in company results and the non calendar year in company's quarterly results. So there's quite an outpouring of information on that. The one that most springs to mind at the moment for me is the interview that Bernard Arnault did for the results for LVMH. He doesn't do the quarterly interviews regularly. And he only does it in French. And all of that's a bit of a statement when you think about it. And I, I applaud it in many respects. So the chief executive shouldn't be on every quarterly call, you know, and discussing guidance and all these other wonderful things that uh, artists get obsessed with. He should make an occasional appearance and so on. And uh, the fact that it's in French is, is, is better again. But the bit that struck me about it was, if you look at the last three goods companies, particularly LBMH, they've been through a period of very sharp growth, 20% per annum growth. And China did extremely well, much to the surprise of many people during the lockdown. So people kept shopping for luxury goods during that period. Uh, given the size of this company now, there, it, any company of that size can't keep growing at 20% growth. It's not going to happen. So inevitably it will slow down. 
And of course, I mean, the analysts are ready to get, you know, the commentators are really get ter- hysterical about that inevitability when it occurs. But on the last call, he was talking about growth rates. And the growth rate was actually better than people expected during this period. But he came out with something really rather interesting. He said that he didn't want to grow at that 20% per annum, even if he could. And the reason he gave for that, and I think it's half the reason, but it's still a valid reason, is he said that part of what they sold was quality. And, and it was more important to maintain quality than it was to increase volume. That's an awful lot of people have a, a view of designer goods in particular that there's all a factory in Hong Kong turning them out and they just put a different label on it and charge more. And really he was aiming for the opposite of that impression in terms of uh, uh, what you're going for in luxury goods. And, and of course, I mean, the unspoken part of his answer was you can't engender a feeling of exclusivity if you continue to grow at, at, at a 20% clip. <laughs> and I thought it was an interesting answer. He basically said, I don't want to grow up about nine attempts. And I, it's, uh, I, I really thought that was an interesting reflection from somebody who is clearly extremely good at what he does, you know? Because I think an awful lot of people would assume just more growth is better. You know, no, 20% is better than 10, surely. Well, I mean, he was basically saying, not really, not really, not if you do what we do for a living. I like, what he does for a living is interesting because the, and you know, at the moment we're getting a, a fair amount of pressure, have had not just now, but for the last year or more on the consumer companies. And it's partly because we've had uh, input cost inflation, we've therefore had price inflation. That's led to a slowdown or even retreat in volumes. You put the prices up, the volumes don't go up as much, that's for sure. We've had a bit of shrinkflation. You're getting three Regmans instead of four in a box or whatever it is at the moment. Uh, and all those fine things going on. And of course, one of the other things that you're threatened with, in some, sometimes even more, more in one sector than another, is private label. That people do various things when they're trading down. One of the things they do is they shop at a, a lower margin retailer. They'll go from shopping at Waitrose to Tesco to Aldi or Lidl or something, whatever. But the other thing they might do is they go to private label. And of course, one of the great reflections on on designer goods, uh, luxury goods, is there isn't any own label, is it? <laughs> The label is indeed the whole point. <laughs> yeah. You're not going to see any old label designer goods. I mean, old label designer goods presumably are counterfeits. You know. <laughs> yeah, so, you touched on a couple of other things there. Most and the most interesting article I've read recently was a Robert Armstrong unhedged article in the Financial Times when he interviewed a professor, I think from the University, University of Pennsylvania, who's a, an expert on the law of uh, antitrust competition law. And it was basically an interview solely based on this guy's views around the actions in the in the tech sector. And, and to cut a long story short, he basically thought most of it was completely misguided, that they were aiming for the wrong sector, that they, you know, really they, they, there is intense competition within elements of the tech sector, and, uh, and that they were going to fail as a result in an awful lot of the antitrust actions that are on the table, which I guess is our view as well, to a considerable degree. And... It was a really interesting take on the one. And books I've read, I don't think you're probably going to follow me on my recent reading. I just finished Sugden's two volume, and it's a thousand pages of volume, Biography of Nelson. And so, unless you're really into your, your military history and so on, you're not going to be following me on that one. But I'll give you what I think is the punchline for it. The first volume ends in 1797 when Nelson is back in the UK having fought in the Battle of Cape St. Vincent, which he was famously decorated for and became a Viscount Nelson. But he'd also fought in, in the Mediterranean and lost his eye, his right eye and his right arm in the battle in Tenerife. And, and so he was a pretty, and he'd been hit by a splinter at the Battle of Cape St. Vincent in the stomach and had a hernia from it. So he's in pretty bad shape, really given the standard of medical care of those times. So he arrives back in the UK, strikes the flag on his, he's an admiral by now on his warship, goes ashore, and basically everything he says and does and writes suggests that he thinks his career is over. You know, he's got one eye, one arm, and and this bad sort of abdominal injury as well. And he thinks his career is over. And of course, ahead of it, he lay the battles of the Nile, Copenhagen, and of course, Trafalgar. And I, think, I do think it's a lesson for all of us, you know? Absolutely. Sometimes you think, oh, it's all over. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you for that. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah. Um, so Toby, you fairly recently published that that kind of annual letter that you do, which kind of looks back at the last the last kind of calendar year. I mean, 2023 to characterise that the relatively small group of stocks, which now the financial press will just very commonly term the magnificent seven, just accounting for 
a really very large proportion of overall returns and optimism over AI was the driving force of a number of those names, at least. Some of that group were obviously are represented in the funds, but yeah. this kind of narrow breadth of the market caused challenges over the last year, just I mean, purely because the rest of the market performed notably poor, I guess. But what were your kind of key takeaways from AI optimism and, and last year? Yeah, well, I mean, on the magnificent seven first, you're absolutely right. The uh, they provided two thirds of the Nasdaq return in seven stocks, and unless you owned certain of those stocks, in fact, most of them, in the right way, to you just couldn't perform. That's it. And look, we're never going to own Tesla. We didn't have any Nvidia, as it happens, which was obviously the early popular choice as the winner in AI in the in the chip sector and in the semiconductor sector. And and you go through them uh, and look at them like that. We did own Amazon, then we sold it. So that's another. And we were actually quite underweight in Apple. But yeah, we were not brilliantly positioned in relation to the Magnificent Seven. And I guess my take on them is, I think it's a bit dangerous to to get your performance. Uh, yeah, but if you own it, good for you. But it's a bit dangerous, really, because if you take a even a slightly longer perspective, we did this search where we did at any company over about ten billion market cap, so big enough for us to own. And we looked at those companies of that size, which had produced 20% over the last two years. Not just one year, but not, you know, long but two years. And there were 241 companies that qualified and that had done uh, 20%, which is, you know, 9.5% per annum, which is what the index does over long periods of time. And therefore, if we don't, then we'd have done better. Yeah. And boy, what a weird bunch they are. Uh, they are 45 energy companies, you know? They're dominated by insurance companies, banks, energy companies, and so on. And in fact, and this comes back to the Magnificent Seven, only one of the Magnificent Seven qualified, NVIDIA. The other six didn't have a two-year performance that even equaled the index. Right? It's a very short-term phenomenon. And really, if you said, Terry, how could you have performed during 2022 and 2023? The answer is, I should have been in energy stocks in 2022 because nothing else performed. And then switched into the Magnificent Seven in 2023. Well, I don't think I'm ever going to be able to do that, basically. <laughs> and in fact, I don't know any other human beings who can do it either. Even with a much smaller fund where you could be more nimble if you wanted to be, the mindset to be in energy stocks in one year and, and in video the next year is, wow, you know? So it, it was quite uh, challenging, I think, for, for almost any mark to, uh, to do very well in those circumstances. As for AI, I just think it's very early days. Um, You'll see in my annual letter, I quote the winners by sector over the last 30 years or so on emerging sectors in technology and how the early run was made by companies that if you bet on them being the ultimate winner, you'd have been wrong. You'd have bet on Intel in chips and you'd have been wrong. You'd have bet on America Online and Internet Service Providers. You'd have bet on Yahoo in search. You'd have bet on Research in Motion, made BlackBerry in mobile phones, MySpace in social networks. So, we really, we're not good at saying, ah, yeah, that's the winner right off the outset and getting it right. So I think it's unlikely that we know the winner. And I'm, I just wonder what winner means in any event, because, you know, there are people who are making chips like NVIDIA are, are going to be deployed, or are being deployed in, in uh, data centers to uh, basically power this. Uh, and there are people like Microsoft and to, to a lesser extent, others like uh, Meta and Google or Alphabet who are basically providing the, infrastructure in terms of data centers, servers, and installed software and operating systems and so on for you to run the AI models. And then there are people beyond that who presumably are going to deploy in their functions, people like Adobe in, in graphics and Intuit in kind of software. And you get to go, well, I understand that everybody's very excited, get that. But if this works like businesses normally work, how do the, the third group of people, this is the, you know, the sort of the Adobe's and the Intuit's, are they going to make much money out of AI? Because first of all, I'm not sure what it does that can generate them extra revenues. Maybe the functionality will make us pay a bit more for this software. But are they going to have to pay all those other people I mentioned to get it? <laughs> because they don't actually own the large language model, do they? They don't own the generative AI. They don't own, you know, uh, the, unlike Microsoft, who at least own a share in, uh, in, in OpenAI and Copilot, they don't own that, do they? So they're going to get that supplied to them by somewhat, OpenAI, I guess, it is one of the suppliers, and they're going to have to run it on a data set that provided by uh, Microsoft or Amazon or Alphabet. And they're really going to make a, a, a sort of money out of it that makes the stock go up 70% in the year. I doubt it. 
Uh, and I think we get very much more excited by developments than sometimes they merit in terms of what they'll produce in hard cash profitability for us. Yeah, the, the race should, certainly hasn't been won quite yet with AI. It's got a lot longer well, well, you, you can't point to any virtually hard revenue consequence of a positive consequence of that. I mean, you could say Microsoft Copilot a bit, yeah. uh, but you'd be hard pressed beyond that to get very much out, out of this in terms of well, now what we earned out of AI last year was the following. It's like, hmm, yeah. Moving maybe away from AI, another area which garnered quite a huge amount of attention over the last 12 months was the success of the development of weight loss drugs. And yeah. in the portfolio holding Novo Nordisk is, is I mean, very prominent in this area. Yeah. Can you talk us through some of your thoughts in that space? Clearly, the, the kind of market forecasts have changed um, quite notably. And maybe to, to tag on a second part of that question, clearly when something so significant comes onto the market, you often think about the the kind of flip side of that and the debate's already started about the impact that these drugs could have on industries such as food and beverages for example which, which are also representative of the fund i just wonder what, how you're tackling that that debate in, in house yeah i mean look we've been actually we've been a holder of those for some time we buy it on the weight loss drug yeah like we in fact it's made, you see if you look in our letter it's made its full annual appearance in our top five contributors so we really like the their approach to, to drug discovery and so on, and and that's what really got us in there. And look, it's a wild success. There's no doubt about that. And there's lots of things that people say around it which are just ridiculous, frankly. I mean, they say, well, but they've got competition. Oh, right. Well, you thought there was going to be one, right? In a market of this potential, you didn't think anyone else was going to try and develop one. Well, of course they'll develop one. We'll roll through developments in that area. I think the thing that's yet to surprise people here is the degree to which they are efficacious for other other morbidities, other conditions. And look, we know that they are they do, or at least we know that the the Wagyu Zempic semaglutide works for cardiovascular conditions and reduces significantly the impact of cardiovascular because they've got a label for the FDA in that. We know that it improves kidney function or at least stops it in your kidney function, which I think is all we can hope for. And we know that because they stopped the trial early because the FDA gave them permission to because it was so successful. They just want to get the drug out there because it's so good. And we know because they've just announced the stage three, I think it is, for arthritis and autoimmune conditions. So things like arthritis and, and lupus, we know it's going to deal with that. We know that it's got a, a vast impact on liver function as well. And, and I think you will see other things come in due course. So I think Alzheimer's, arresting Alzheimer's is, is something that we're going to see. And, uh, yeah, and it will roll on in drugs. So I think there's an awful lot of this stuff. out, And that's important because, well, it's good. And... Um, and it's important because when you think about something where it's clearly quite a high cost drug, as it is at the moment, one of the points of getting people to buy it or getting insurers to insure it or health systems to prescribe it is what it will do for you in other respects. You know, if you're taking this, reduces the likelihood of cardiovascular incidents, cuts the kidney and liver deterioration, means that you don't have to take medications for autoimmune conditions and so on. You clearly got net savings uh, elsewhere across the system. And I think that's it's quite an important plank in this. As for what it does for, for the rest of the industry, I mean, it is a bit early to draw any real firm conclusions, but it's the, the, for me, the amusing thing is when these drugs first appeared, the, the sort of the chattering classes, the commentary, you also always like to say there's something wrong. Oh, it won't work because their, their take on it in the very early going, if you look up the articles from about 18 months ago, were this is a terrible drug because we've got a lifestyle drug because what people will do is they'll take it and then they'll continue to binge on unhealthy foods and fast foods and so on and so forth, which apart from being categorically wrong, showed a fundamental misunderstanding of how the drug works. <laughs> uh, absolutely, to never let the facts get in the way of an opinion for some of these people. And the fact is, it does suppress your appetite, right? It slows your digestive uh, cycle, it suppresses your appetite. Uh, and so we've got, there's no doubt that opens up questions for what it does in the food and beverage sector. And with all of the cautionary remarks I, I, I've already given you, and I'll repeat them about its early days, the area that looks most vulnerable to us is alcoholic beverages. There was quite a smart remark from the, the Coca-Cola CEO the other day who was asked about its impact, and he said, look, it might have an impact on food, but the fact is people have got to take a certain amount of hydration every day. It's just a, a fact of survival. And given that we supply carbonated soft drinks, non-carbonated soft drinks, water, coffee, tea... I think we've got the bases covered, really. So I think we're going to be all right. Now, we might sell a bit less of this and a bit more of that as a result of this, but you're going to keep drinking, aren't you? 
I don't think that's true. What you can't say is that people keep eating as much or much of the same things. That's a bit worrisome for some people, isn't it? And I think drinking is the thing that's most obvious in, in the crosshairs, just from observed behaviours of what people who are taking the drugs uh, are doing. Uh, and so for that reason, we haven't been adding to our uh, holding, for example, in Diageo, even though it looks relatively cheap at the moment. It's had a bit of a fall from grace as a result of this recent glitch in, in Latin America where it didn't seem to have much control and knowledge of the, of the stock in its supply distribution supply chain and, and got caught out by a fall in demand. And the stock looks cheap on conventional measures, but we're not adding. And the reason we're not adding is exactly that, that we think this is, we've yet to see this work through in terms of vulnerability. Yeah. I understood. Yeah. We, might, we might learn more about those trends uh, over the next year or so, perhaps. Okay. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, thank, yeah. thank you for that. Um, maybe changing tack slightly, we talked about some quite specific areas of the portfolio. Many of the, talking about kind of process, your kind of, your very strict process that you, you have on the fund, and many of the listeners, I'm sure, will be familiar with those three steps, as you, as you described them, that first step only invest in good companies the second step don't overpay and the third step is do nothing as you describe it and i think perhaps we we focus a lot on the first two but i, I wonder if today we could just focus on the th- that, that do nothing or, or what some people might term the the, the sell discipline and, and if we look at kind of turnover for the strategy particularly compared to some of the peers in, in your fund group Turnover has been very low, clearly, um, but you have taken action where and, and sold holdings when something has gone awry, and you've done that over the course of the fund's life. I, I wondered if how challenging it's been with the strategy. With clearly, you, you want to own things for the long term; it's the whole idea. But distinguishing between a company having a kind of short-term bump in, yeah. versus a kind of a more fundamental change that really does need um, action in terms of the portfolio. Yeah. I, I always said we, we do really spend time regularly thinking about how we could do this better. And certainly in the last 12 to 24 months, the thing that we were like to most in terms of doing this better is, is getting selling better. But it's problematic um, because we keep getting conflicting lessons. We held on and didn't sell certain companies. I mean, we did sell them eventually, but we held on a little too long. About, and, and we sold them and we sold them and they kept going down. So that's great. But Things are, I'm thinking here of things like Estee Lauder and paper. Yeah. Were we right to sell them? Yeah. Could we have sold them earlier? Definitely. And I guess what we could have done there is alighted earlier upon the changes which we thought made them uh, sell. And the problem is we actually really did know those changes. I, I don't think they were unknown to us in something like PayPal. And an awful lot of people say, do you engage with management? I said, we do. But I guess what our conclusion was out of Unilever, which we didn't sell, by the way, and PayPal and Estee Lauder to a degree is engagement doesn't get you very far, that the management don't really do anything about it, don't listen. And so out of that, we reached a conclusion. When we think things are not going as we think they should be going, just sell it. And then, of course, what we did was we sold Adobe and Amazon and got that completely wrong because they kept going. And so at the end of that, I just had a bit of a headache, really. Thinking, well, yeah, I held on to some companies and tried to engage to change things, and that didn't work. And then I got Adobe bidding for Figma and I met them and I said, oh, $20 billion acquisition. Could you tell us the numbers so we can see what it's like? They said, no. We said, you're not going to test any numbers at all, no. And it's a big, comp- and we got nothing else. It sold the stock. And of course, they got then swept up in the AI hype and kaboom, you get egg on your face. And the same thing happened with Amazon. We bought Amazon and only Andy Jassy, it's a relatively new CEO, started waxing lyrical about wanting to go large in, in grocery e-commerce, which is bonkers, frankly, right? <laughs> And so we said, well, we're not going to bother trying to engage with them. Because if we try to engage with them, they completely ignore it. So we sold the stock. Oh, it goes up. And so after all that, I had a sort of headache. And I had to sit with a sort of towel on my head and talk to my colleagues and go, I've got completely conflicting messages here. What am I going to do? And, and we, only, the only thing we could reach was, the conclusion is, when they are doing things which take them off piste in terms of what you want them to do and should be doing, you should sell, and the sole exception is when there's clearly a big zeitgeist tailwind from some hype like AI, right? Otherwise, you just deal with it. The management isn't going to listen to you, sell the shares, except when you've got something going on like we had in AI last year, right? So I think that's what we're going to try and put down as a rule of thumb. As for, you know, when you recognize what's a glitch and what's something different. I mean, we've had quite a few companies with glitches that we've managed to jump on. IDEX changing to from the sort of wholesale distributors to individual bets is a, an absolute classic of a glitch that we we light upon there. 
And I think, yeah, you, know, you can see others out there. There's probably one right now in Metal Toledo, the Wang equipment company we are, who've had a problem with logistics with their supplier and then it's a switch supplier and it's been disastrous and we've got to try and correct that. It's not a glitch when people do fundamentally different things. When you say, actually, we're going to go and buy things out here which are not in our regular business and make them work. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, which is PayPal. And, and, yeah, and to a degree, Intuit. Intuit or MailChimp is what? You're an accounting software business, actually, and, and credit card before. It's like, no, 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 no. And so you know, one is definitely a fundamental change of the business. The other one is you stuck your toe because you changed the warehouse. And that, that's really the difference, I think. Yeah. yeah no, really interesting. Thanks for your thoughts there. And the final question we, we have been asking everyone, actually, is just to highlight one area of your investment uni- universe that you have particularly high conviction in, in at the moment. And you might turn around at me and say, I've got this number of stocks, I've got conviction in, 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 in every single one. But I just wonder whether there was one area that you'd highlight yeah. there. I mean, yeah, I, I wouldn't mind. I mean, I, I would say highly performing stocks from last year. Ask the name the highly performing stocks this year. I think it's quite likely some of the same ones will recur. Probably Novo Nordisk, you know, so I don't think we're anywhere near through what's what's about to emerge in terms of the weight of So probably Meta. I mean, Meta is clearly very well sorted. And uh, to the great surprise of many people, Mark Zuckerberg can actually run a business. Uh, but that. I won't be Microsoft. You know, Microsoft is clearly in a, in a position to benefit strongly from from developments in terms of, of AI and so I think. But if I had to pick an area, there's those sort of bridge areas a bit. Don't they? I had to pick an area. I would say, not this very minute, but sometime in the next twelve months, I think an area which will do well is our companies that supply laboratory equipment. People who put things into the laboratories. So Metal Toledo, who put uh, weighing equipment into laboratories, which is used in the production of drugs and, and food stuffs and so on. And Walters, who make mass spectrometry, liquid chromatography, thermal imaging equipment they put in there, they all had a good pandemic, basically, these companies. There was a big surge in demand. They're really coming in off a hangover from that to some degree. And there's a bit of a downturn in China, which is unhelpful. So they've got a coincidence of two unfortunate events. And I think as they lap those events and come out of them and demand normalizes, I think they'll do well, is my guess. That area of people who supply things into laboratories for drug testing and bioprocessing and drug manufacturing and foodstuffs and so on, I think they'll probably rebound in the next 12 months or so, I guess. Thanks very much, Terry. I really appreciate your time and your your thoughts as always. And thanks for joining us today. Thank you for listening to the Investor Insights Podcast. You can contact info at killick.com, referencing the podcast for more information on any of the topics discussed or for further details on the services offered by Kinnick & Co. This podcast is not personal advice. The content is intended for educational purposes only and is not investment research or a recommendation to buy or sell any financial instrument or product or to adopt any investment strategy. The value of your investments can rise as well as fall and you could get back less than you invested. Past performance is not a guide to future performance. The investments referred to in this podcast may not be suitable for all investors and you should seek advice from a qualified investment advisor. Killick & Co. is authorised and regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority, the FCA.